Um, okay, um, today I'm going to be talking about countering micro UVs with micro Doppler and multi stat radars. Uh, some of you have seen work presented previously on this, and this was actually presented at the military radar conference yesterday. Um, so it's pitched to people that don't necessarily know NetRad, NextRad, or other aspects of the radar. So I apologize if I'm repeating stuff to some people here. So I'm going to introduce the problem and summary of what, what I've been doing, what we've been doing here. Uh, talk about the challenge of micro UAVs to radar systems, uh, traditional radar systems, certainly. Um, talk about multi stack ex experiments, which is what we lead on here at UCL and uh, globally uh, in that research domain. And uh, mention uh, micro Doppler and its phenomena and how that can be used to your advantage when looking at these kind of platforms when you want to detect them. Uh, I'll briefly explain a payload experiment we completed with a small micro UAV with the help of uh, Jarrah's, um, the undergrad, that was a project here over the summer. And then uh, talk about planned future measurements and conclusions of what I said. So, UAVs uh, have been used by the military for many years now. And they come in different guises, um, as you can see in some of the pictures on this slide here. Um, they're used in lots of different applications within the military now. Anything you can do in the sky uh, it can be applied using a UAV pretty much now. Surveillance, attack, um, EW techniques that he's been speaking about previously, as well as resupplying uh, forward operating bases. Uh, but commercial UAVs have been <coughs> used much more greatly in society now. And they have applications uh, in leisure, photography, fun, question mark, depending on what you like. Um, they also, in parcel delivery, if you speak to Amazon, providing the internet if you speak to Facebook. Um, but more seriously, in my opinion, uh, things like anti-poaching applications, 3D mapping, crop monitoring, and search and rescue are really interesting engineering applications to these kind of platforms. But they also have the potential to be misused, and that's the kind of things I'll be touching on now, and why we may want to detect them in certain locations. Um, but in the military aspects, Drones, uh, tactical drones, uh, mail, hail. These are all these massive UAV platforms here that we certainly don't have access to at university. What I'm going to be talking about is micro UAVs, which are commercially available to the public, uh, and they can be operated in hundreds of meter kind of radius and altitudes. So these are much more like the, the platforms that I'll be discussing today. Uh, generally, the quadcopter formats, with hexacopters and octocopters. Um, more traditional helicopter and fixed wing platforms. Uh, this smaller one here perhaps is a nano UAV, not micro UAV, but that's getting into semantics on that. Nevertheless, there's many different platforms out there. And why are we doing this? Well, some of the challenges uh, <clears throat> are being brought up because they're being used and misused much more widely now in society. Here a drone was flown onto a platform Angela Merkel was speaking at. A uh, football match between Serbia and Al Albania, a drone was flown into the, into the stadium with a, quite a controversial flag on, 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 on it, and, and that caused the football match to be abandoned. People were filming a Star Wars set just outside of London, trying to get some sneak previews of what's going on there. But more seriously, uh, issues such as uh, plane strikes um, near airports, or um, going into restricted airspaces surrounding nuclear power plants in France, are some real problems um, which don't, don't have any solutions currently with traditional radar systems. So it's a new type of problem that traditional radar sensors will, have, will struggle with. Uh, they're difficult to detect, and I think they're classified as slow, small, and low in, in aviation terms, so that makes them a challenge. Uh, it's an asymmetric threat, threat because they're small, but they, have, they do have the potential to do <coughs> um, some damage there especially in terms of a, an air collision. Um, and it's an interesting challenge from my perspective. We work in the engineering department. If you open up any engineering magazine right now, there's been plenty of articles about drones as well. So it is really a hot topic. Uh, being used in things such as volcano monitoring, <coughs> like Niles' work um, in his domain, um, anti-poaching, crop monitoring, in photography, so just a really wide range of applications, and they're being used, and that might bring up opportunities to collaborate people if they're being used more, than, and we want to sense them, so there are potentially more collaborations out there. 
In terms of prior literature, or what other people have been doing in this domain, or looking at this, um, I think TNO in, in the Netherlands, and Tellers Netherlands, have looked at these kind of platforms a, few, a fair bit, more than most out there. And they've looked at a few different UAVs and compared them to birds. Again, a helicopter, quadcopter, octocopter, some RCS measurements, microdoppler measurements, pardon me, and that was by David Tamouche, who's based in the US. And this is a VTOL vertical takeoff, sonic landing, um, versus a bird classification. And also, we have our external PhD student here, Berger Torvik, which is looking at uh, the microdoppler of birds and how that compares to drone platforms. So there is there is some people looking at it, but it, it's certainly not a mature field, and there's there's a lot of potential there. So going over some of the systems that we have at UCL and we're developing at UCL. Obviously, everybody in this room is aware of what NetRAD is, our, our three-node multi-static radar system. Collaboration between us and Cape Town, funded by Office of Naval Research. Um, and we've completed um, sea clutter maritime target campaigns back in 2011. And we've also recently completed human microdoppler and uh, wind turbine measurements with that system. And the, the new system uh, will be dual band and dual polarimetric higher power in the L-band as well. Also a three mobile, uh, three node mobile uh, platform that we can, we can deploy. And that will give us even more opportunities to sense these platforms in different bands and use different polar, polarimetric results. So why do, why do we use multi-stack radars here at UCL? Well, the advantages of multi-stack radar is um, increased coverage and redundancy, um, whether you're whether you're betting everything on a single radar or you have multiple platforms, um, you're more likely to extend your coverage, more likely to have a uh, detection of a difficult to detect target, get more information on that target from different, different perspectives. And that brings into, uh, into play things like data fusion, which is a whole field in itself uh, of study, and lots of opportunities to play around with that experimentally, and we're very lucky that we have that platform and can do this. Um, in more military applications, the receive-only nodes are, are less, less complex and more difficult to jam and detect where they are, and there's potential counter-stealth applications of more static systems. Um, but we think that you need to quantify these advantages, and that's our goals when we go out and do experimental work with NetRAD, to say how good this is and what additional information we got, uh, and is it worth developing a fully multi-static system compared to just using a, just using a monostatic data equivalent. And quickly, microdoppler. Microdoppler um, is the vibrational rotation of a component of a target, which is uh, relative to its bulk translational motion. And that translates to, in a human, it's your arms and legs swinging as you move forwards. In a microdrone, it's the rotor blades rotating as it's flying. Platforms that we looked at initially, the first one was this AR Parrot drone. Um, 1.8 kilograms, has a camera on it, and it uses a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi link uh, to control it, as well as stream that video. We started that with computer science, because it was actually their platform, we borrowed it to do an experiment. And it was our first aim to, to just see if we can detect it, what it looks like. It's mostly plastic, so it's going to be hard to detect, it won't have a large reflection. And then look at what, was, what does the multi-static data bring to the table with this kind of target. So we brought our three nodes of NetRAD and took the target out to Shenley Sports Ground and did some measurements. Good news is we could see the target statically, just on a pedestal. Um, we saw, firstly, nothing, the pedestal, the drone on the pedestal, and then the drone slightly metallized to see how much that increases the RCS. <coughs> we also saw it as we increased in range and saw how that, that effect. Um, the vertical scale it. there is just arbitrary dB. Yes. Did you attempt to calibrate it as to dB meter squared? We, we didn't do a calibrated results there. These are all relative measurements to, uh, to an absolute peak of, of zero dB. Um, but through the calibration with the work we're doing with Ricardo, potentially in the future we can do fully calibrated results on these kind of targets. <coughs> Our issue in using this platform was that was a completely static test with the drone off. As soon as we turned the drone on and tried to control it and just make it hover in position, the drone was operating in the same ISM band as the radar. 
So in effect, we were jamming ourselves um, when we were controlling the drone. So here, this is some internal um, components of the NetRat system itself. But highlighted here are the, the drone detection, so we can see it as a target, but the horizontal lines represent the interference of the comm signal that were happening at the time. This became even worse when the drone started moving um, because you're obviously sending commands uh, for it to, to fly forwards and increasing the data rate of the comm signal. And this generated a lot more interference. So we, we went away and we changed platforms. So rather than working at something that's going to jam us, we, we chose a platform that works at 5.8 gigahertz, the higher frequency Wi-Fi band, away from uh, NetRad's central frequency. And um, this platform here, the DJI, DJI drone, is 1.2 kilograms. It's a bit faster, more stable, and a bit better built than the previous platform. We did an experiment in July this year. Here's some images of, of the drone on a, just on some cardboard mounts here. Um, out in the field, open field, obviously not much clutter there. This is it in the chamber. We were looking at what it looks like when you just rotate it around a bit. That's a generic picture of it. So again, we like to see if we can detect it, um, what it looks like, uh, what the five gigahertz frequency, if there is any 2.4, uh, and how, how, how this platform comes across. So on the left here, we have a time range plot. This is the internal signal within the radar itself. And this is the drone platform going away, towards, away, towards, away. And this is the tree line at the end of the field. Um, using a CFAR script that Colin Horn developed, uh, this is that data cleaned up uh, slightly, with the operator, so the individual person, as uh, seen here, which is a larger signal to the drone. I can actually show you a video. This is a video from, from that platform on that day. So you can see us sitting at the end of the field here, monitoring the drone, going back and forth. Um, the camera works a little bit poor, but that's that's because of a radar engineer, not a cameraman, I think. Where is the operator? The operator is to one side down here. He was in the field of view of the radar, um, just to make sure you, you could see the um, the drone's motion and you could see how far it was going to the full extent. Because it was traveling quite far out, and you wanted to have eyes on whilst you're controlling it. So, um, after that, we did an experiment with Fraunhofer, um, Alex Charlich and Paul Kerhoffman, the researchers there. Um, we put some GPS loggers to get ground truth to tell us where the drone was relative to what the radar, where the radar thought it was. And here you can see a range time plot of that, where the blue dots are the detections from the radar, and the red line is the ground truth from the GPS logger. And this shows very close agreement, which we were, we were happy with. Uh, at the end here, again, these detections are from the, the tree line at the end of the field. And in this section where the, rate, where the drone was lost, you can see down here, that was where the drone actually left the, um, uh, the beam width of the central radar and then only returned a bit later when it, when it was detected again. So it matched up with what we'd expect from this staring configuration. Um, we found that using a center of gravity, using all the, the, the range side lobes uh, adjacent to the central peak, uh, gave us a sub-meter accuracy um, agreement with the GPS logging uh, information. And we're aiming to fuse this, these detections um, and see the advantages of using one, two, and three radars uh, and how the accuracy increases and how the track fidelity increases and things like this. And that's an ongoing piece of work that we did with Framhoff. Another experiment we did was an individual crossing uh, a drone platform. As you can see here, a person and a drone crossing each other in front of the in front of the system. And this will, this is where microdopper perhaps comes into it when you talk about classifying targets. Because here, yes, one of the targets does look slightly more um, uh, larger amplitude, but there isn't much characteristic results in between those two targets to differentiate them, what they are. But that comes out really strongly when you take when you go into the Doppler domain. So here you've got the individual person walking away with his arms and legs swinging in a periodic manner as people walk. And here you have the drone platform flying in the opposite direction. So clearly in this domain you can see a significant difference between a person and a drone. Um, this was measured in the vertical polarization, which is effective when you're looking at human microdoppler because we're generally taller than we are wider. Um, but the drones are 
in the horizontal plane with the rotation of their blades. So if you want to look at the microdoppler of drone platforms, you should be configured, configured in a H-pole configuration. And that would bring out the microdoppler on the blades and reduce that of the human's um, arms and leg modulation. But there's lots of information in the microdoppler signatures. And this has got a good opportunity to do some classifications on what type of drone platform it is. Here's another comparison between the two different polarizations of the same hovering result of these two, two uh, the same drone. In H-pole, you see all these um, components the, from the rotating uh, blades of the drone. In vertical polarization, same day, same configuration, same platform. Um, those are lost. Um, so it's key in terms of what polarization you look, you're looking at. And there's information within, within these blade signatures as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. We did a payload experiment where we weighed down the drone with no weight at all, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 grams in small metal discs um, of bulk weight. We hovered it at a distance of approximately 70 meters. We were operating the radar in, in low power mode, uh, although we do have a higher power mode where we could put it in much higher ranges. And we were aiming to distinguish between the drone's signature um, when it was weighed down and when it wasn't to potentially be able to classify whether a drone had been modified and someone had attached something to it, or someone hadn't. Experimental results, we found that the RCS, or the amplitude of the reflections, did show a trend of increasing amplitude as you're adding more metal. Of course, you, you expect the amplitude to increase, but it was a bit inconclusive because the hovering wasn't perfect, perfect, so it may have had a larger reflection because it was slightly closer, or was it weighed down? and by more metal and further away. So that wasn't a perfect way of distinguishing or classifying. But when you look at the microdoppler signatures, this is the monostatic result with no payload, and then this is it with a half a kilogram payload. And the, the blade um, flashes and the blade's characteristic signatures are very different now. And this is the, the same bistatic result simultaneously measured. So we used um, some feature extraction on these two Tick these two signatures to find that were connected to the Doppler centroid and um, bandwidth of, pardon me, of the microdoppler signatures. And we found that just using two features, we were able to separate in the feature domain um, the three scenarios of no payload, half a kilogram, and 200 grams. And they were clearly separated from this is the three nodes of data in all occasions. So this is, this is good news in terms of. The characteristic signature of those three different scenarios was, was separable in, in that feature space. And that made it an easy job to, to classify whether the drone was weighed down or not. And we applied a discriminant analysis and an IA phase analysis type of classifier. We used just monostatic data, and we had you know, an order of 97, 98% accuracy. When you use all the data, that drops down. and you might be thinking, hang on, you've just told us multi-stacks is good. What? We're getting a disadvantage there. This comes in, you need to use the multi-stacks in the correct way. Rather than just putting all the data in one bucket and doing a single classification on that, if you use a binary voting system where each of the three radars decides with a certain level of confidence, whether it was A, B, or C in terms of the weightings, and then you take the net result of that, then that increases that because even, even greater to an order of 99, even 100% in some cases when you trained on 30% of the data. This needs further exploration, but uh, it's promising initial results. So today I've told you about micro UV, UAVs and why they're interesting, why they potentially are a problem. Uh, discussed the two different platforms that we've measured, the Parrot and the DJI drone. Um, said how range doppler tracking applications and algorithms are, are an aim of ours to develop with our multi-static system. Uh, seeing the difference in, in H and B pole in human microdoppler and drone microdoppler, and shown a proof of concept of classifying um, drones with different payloads using just, a, just two features and a multi-static radar. In the future, I think we'd like to do more multi-static experiments on these kind of platforms, different type of platforms, see what their properties look like, different types of um, blade materials, plastic, carbon fiber, and metal, uh, and experiment with um, a full multi-state range Doppler tracking uh, kind of setup. I think that'd be very interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks.